All right. Um, yeah, I'm going to jump right in. Um, yeah, I don't need to say a lot more. Um, this was a, a pretty good introduction. So uh, I should just probably update my photo. This photo is like two years old. Um, a lot of things have changed in the world in the last two years and, and also all around my head. Um, and actually, I'm, I need to admit I'm a big fan of, of Fabian's dreadlocks. I used to have dreadlocks um, when I was still in high school. Um, so I, I definitely like that. Yeah, so what, we gonna, what are we going to talk about today? Um, as Olivia said before, it's like in these cloud native meetups, it's a lot about Kubernetes. So we're going to talk about Kubernetes in this talk. And um, yeah, just one thing, I would like to have this as, as interactive as possible. Um, I don't have a super strict agenda. Um, I'm, I'm just going to see how much I can squeeze into that half hour. So if you have any questions or want me to show anything, just feel free to drop it in the chat. Um, also, I don't, I'm not sure if you can unmute and just start talking. It would be fine with me. If you can't use the chat, I'm, I'm fine with this. So yeah, what are we going to talk about? Um, it's, I think that the talk is called What's Going On in My Cluster and kind of revolves about the topic of, of Kubernetes observability. However, observability might be a bit, bit misleading as this kind of goes a lot of in this like application performance monitoring kind of space. So this one is really more about, um, yeah, understanding and visualizing the things that are happening inside of a Kubernetes cluster. As, as Renata said, I'm, I'm not only working as a consultant in the cloud native space, I'm also teaching um, at, at university for distributed systems. And I have to explain and introduce Kubernetes to many people. I, we teach classes here at Novatech, I, I teach students, and um, Kubernetes is pretty hard in the beginning with all the different API objects and, and, and structures that it has. And um, normally you start off with the, with the CLI and it's kind of hard to get the idea what is actually going on there. And this is basically the reason for this talk, just to figure out, yeah, um, let's try to understand things a little bit better, make it easier for people to get familiar with the technology, adapt it, and, and, and um, yeah, be, like enable people to use it, use it in a better way. Now, um, yeah, so there are options. There are many kind of, I should say, altitudes on which you can enter and um, observe things in and around the Kubernetes environment. So we're going to look at a few today. Um, we're going to start on a kind of entry level, the, the Kubernetes API. This is probably what everyone has already. Then we're going to look a little bit into service meshes and eBPF. And like the, the most advanced and specialized way of observing things that are happening in the cluster would be like logging and tracing. We're not going to go too deep into tracing, um, mostly because there's, it gets too specialized and there's so many things there. One thing I wanted to highlight real quick, I'm not only teaching at university, I'm also like mentoring a lot of thesis works. And, and the, the, the foundation of this talk or the basis for this was given by a, 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 a bachelor thesis from Yannick. So this is just a quick shout out to him. He's done a great job. Um, so he should be mentioned here as well. Um, all right, so I think I said that. Why are we doing this talk? Um, basically showing various open source option to improve the insights and understanding, diagnose health and, and what is going on in, in the cluster. So a quick disclaimer here. Um, I let's just a quick look at the time. Um, I'm only going to show um, open source and, and, and like free things. So um, there's of course plenty of um, commercial software out there to, to get better control and, 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 and insight into a Kubernetes environment. But very often, I'm, I'm not sure uh, which of them might be the right ones for my, for my clients. And so we start with, with basic building blocks out of the open source world, which will most likely help um, to, to identify the real needs and kind of observability that you really have. And if you know all that, you can still narrow down the scope and buy a commercial version if you want to have it. Now, most of the things that I'm going to show, I'm going to show live. Um, and I have different cloud, 
clusters, different tools. So not everything will probably work straight away. So hope you are patient enough. And um, yeah, so I said it before, this one is not going to be too deep about application specific logging and tracing. Um, it's more about really getting uh, control and overview in, in the cluster. And um, of course, uh, there's, I say here, no guarantee for completeness. So I should much rather say there is, it's definitely a guarantee for incompleteness because there's so many things out there that you can use. Um, and probably I don't know all of them and half an hour would not be enough. So most of you have probably seen this diagram. This is a screenshot of the Cloud Native Community Foundation landscape. This is about half a year old. So it's probably doubled since then again. So there's a lot of tools and technologies that revolve all around the, the um, Kubernetes ecosystem, so to say. And if you narrow down here a bit, like down here, there is one section for observability and analysis. And even there, there are a lot of tools. And some of them we'll see. And we also see others which might not even be listed in there. Now, before I dive in, I want to say maybe a few words about Kubernetes. Um, so this is kind of an entry level talk. If you're not, if you haven't used it yet, um, just a few things to get started. So we have this platform that runs your applications. We have various roles there, people that deploy application, that consume applications, and that observe applications. We probably gonna look a little closer at the deploy and more likely observe part. Now, if you deal with Kubernetes, you should be kind of familiar with a few concepts. So like all your workloads are being run in containers. Connor has just done a great intro of, of WebAssembly and also mentioned containers. So if you're at a cloud native meetup, I kind of expect you to, to know what a container is. Now, um, the other thing are, are nodes. So this is the, the, um, the, the place where the containers are actually run. Uh, and Kubernetes kind of provides an API and, and API objects to run those containerized workloads and in, in, a, in a scalable and, if, and uh, efficient way on those nodes. So there are things like pods, replica sets, ingresses, services, deployments. These are all those API objects that you will most likely have to learn if you wanna, if you wanna work with Kubernetes. And um, today, I hope to introduce you into a couple of um, easy ways. Now, these are the things that, I'm, that I normally show. I probably narrow it down to two or three um, because otherwise I might run out of the time. In the end, and I hope you can see this all fine. It looks a bit blurry on my end. Um, now, to work with tools that uh, access the Kubernetes API, um, they basically do the same thing as you would do using the command line. Um, in the end, they kind of aggregate the data, the data and bring it into a nicer visual form. There are various ways to do that. We will see, going to see K9S as a command line option tool. Then we have two which are web-based. One is called Octan, one is called Lens. There's another one called Scope. Some of them run inside of the cluster, some of them run outside. The good thing here, and uh, uh, one thing important here in general is, is also about how much are you going to pay, uh, and I'm not saying pay in money, but pay in overhead um, for using those tools. And with those Kubernetes API-based ones, you don't really pay a lot because they, as I said, they're doing basically the same thing as, as you would do anyway. Now, um, all right, so I'm going to, switch my screen here, and I hope you can kind of see this fine. Um, so I'm having, I'm kind of can clear this. I'm having a couple of Kubernetes um, contexts here. I'm gonna make, increase it a little bit. So um, I have a couple of clusters, so I'm going to use this one today. And once you, when you basically start, the first thing you could potentially do is say like CTL get all or like, um, get all from all namespaces like this. And so when to do this, to get like a command and overview, you already see the part of the problem in a, in a normal cluster, there are a lot of uh, artifacts in there and that will resolve in a lot of like scrolling, sorting and, and, and whatsoever. So K9S, the first one I'm going, I'm going to show is like a tooling, um, where you which is also, it doesn't need much. It, it runs on the command line. 
and um, it kind of aggregates the the visualization of um, of what you see with the cube CTL output. So in here, you can also change the clusters if you want to work with different clusters. You can easily access the various namespaces, or you can say um, you have like some options up here. I want to see all the namespaces. So um, if you do this, okay, this and this not working. Now I'm seeing all the, the, the pods in the list. This one also will give me an idea if and highlight things in red if things are not working fine. So I can easily identify are things crashing um, and then I can start looking into the things. Talking about looking into the things, um, if you just basically um, enter on, on a level of a pod, you see the various um, containers if you have a multi-pod container and this one I have like an application and, and the, the Istio sidecar. So if I go deeper in here, I would actually get the logs. Now there's nothing running on that application in the moment, so I don't have any logs. But basically it's kind of, a, if you're quick with your shortcuts, it's an easy way of jumping around um, in that environment. You can also like jump into an edit mode where you would uh, get into your uh, editor of choice and can modify the components. Um, you can do port forwarding, um, displaying the YAML, um, and basic things that you would normally do with UUI as well. However, it's kind of still limited to the um, to the dimension of your um, of your command line. Another one, um, which I think I have started on the command line already. I have many tabs open, and I hope you're not getting as confused as I am. Um, this one is called Octant. And um, this will start like a, a web server on your machine. Um, so this one has apparently lost connection. So we can start it again. So I'm running Octant here. I hope you can see that. So this will start that application and bring it back into the browser. So um, this one, of course, gives you somewhat better navigation because um, you can use like that, that web UI. In here, you can also quickly switch between um, Kubernetes contexts. And within the context, you have like all the namespaces. So you can then uh, go into this. Is your system is actually not the one I wanted. So if you have many like I do in this one, you have to expand the selection, and um, and then there will be a, a, a pre-sorted output for you, um, where you can see okay, what are the the things that I have in my cluster, like deployments, pods, replica sets, services. So especially if you're new, this is a a good and easy way to start. Um, getting familiar with this and, and, and be aware of what kind of things are relevant, um, which Kubernetes artifacts you should be dealing with. There's also some kind of sorting here where you could say which are the parts that are under the discovery and load balancing section, like services, ingress, network policies, pretty much all the things that have to do um, with the network. Then you have the configuration objects and storage and the workloads objects and so on. So technically, you can do similar things like um, we just tried to do in, in K9S. So for example, I'm selecting this pod right now. And um, this will also show me, OK, we have a couple of containers. We have the, the init container, the backend container, and that proxy container. Um, if I want to know the logs, I can here see I can select all the containers or just the one from my application. So nothing has happened here. I can also jump back to creation, and then I would see all the logs that have been have, has have happened so far. One additional cool thing is um, you can also, um, okay, now this does not work today, apparently. 
um, normally you can uh, access a terminal here and um, do like an um, open a terminal in that in that application. Maybe this container didn't support it. Uh, let me just see if I I can probably take a uh, a part where there is no no sidecars, so it might not all of the containers might actually have a shell installed, so you can access that. If it doesn't work, um, we'll just move on to to something else. So I'm trying this one again. So I have basically have deployed a similar application in in, in various namespaces um, to showing different functionality with it. Now this doesn't want to work today. Um, the third tool I wanted to show is called Lens. And um, this one is actually not running in a browser. So this starts up uh, a fat client. All right, so this is crazy now starting to connect. And um, so technically, it will do something similar as we've seen with, with Octan. So you have multiple clusters here, and then you have like an aggregated navigation of all the things happening in the cluster. So um, <clears throat> I can say um, I want to look into what I have as pods. Now it will show all the namespaces, and I can narrow down or select multiple namespaces to, to optimize my view. Um, just trying to using that um, right here. So it shows you the high-level metrics. Um, and I'm going to give this one another shot. So this one would actually let me, if this ever works, um, connect to a shell. So I can quickly, if something is not right, I can quickly jump into um, the various containers, um, look what's happening in there. And um, and I, I think you kind of get the point. So I'm now basically in the, in the container um, where, where this Java application is running. So with that, you can get pretty efficient and quick in navigating around and looking at the things um, in your cluster. So I'll try to move on. Otherwise, um, I might lose a bit of time. Now, look, or basically, just to recap. So the things we could see are basically all the things that we could get with some sort of kubectl get commands anyway, um, but probably not a lot more. Now. The real important thing, which is kind of missing here, I think, is you will not see the connection of the applications in your Kubernetes cluster. So you can see if like a pod is running, um, like what kind of memory it takes, or CPU, basically the, the container metrics. But you're not able to see um, who is talking to whom inside of the cluster. And how does this work? And so in order to, to, to get there, you need to go closer to the network. So one option to do this is called is with using service meshes. I mean, technically, service meshes can do a lot more than just providing observability, but they can they they do that as well because they are they will be um, very close to to all the container workloads. So technically, for those who haven't seen that yet, how this works is you have already we've already touched it briefly. So in every pod, we have at least one container running. So the pod is basically the smallest deployment unit in Kubernetes, which is managed by replica, stateful, or daemon sets. So this, but this is not the important fact here. The important fact is like um, how uh, are we going to access that network traffic in the pod? So basically, if something is running within a pod, it's isolated and running by itself. It needs some kind of services to get exposed for like being reachable within or outside of the cluster. Now, a pod can hold multiple containers. And um, the important thing here is they will be running on the same IP address. So they share the same port range. And technically speaking, one, uh, like one container will see all the network traffic going through here. So if I have an application container, then that proxy container will see all the traffic going to that application container. So this might not be super helpful if it's only one pod. But if you have many, you can apply the same principle. 
So basically, you place an eight, like an agent or a proxy inside of all of your pods, and then those proxies can aggregate those data and send it to like a control instance. So very often we speak here of like a data plane and the control plane. And this control plane now has all the information of network coming from those pods, and now it can correlate it and figure out, yeah, who is actually talking with whom and are things going well? Is it too slow whatsoever? And, and with that, it's also possible to visualize that. So looking, I mean, technologies here are Linkerd, Istio, and Kiali. Today, I'm, we're going to look quickly into, into Istio and, and Kiali. Kiali is basically just a visualization framework that you could put on top of Istio or Linkerd. Um, let me see if that connection is still there. So <clears throat> that's basically the way that it looks. We have a pretty similar, this basically the same application as we had before. Um, we have like an, an ingress that, that brings in the traffic. Then we have a UI component. This is like the service. This is the pod. And it goes to, a, to an internal component and then to a database. Um, we can make things look kind of fancy and saying we're going to want to see the response time. We want to see some traffic animation. And then um, we can already see, OK, um, what is fast? What is slow? Who is talking to whom? And, and so on. Um, in case you're doing more advanced things with your deployment, like blue-green deployment or even canary deployment, you will be able to see that here as well. So I, I enabled this one with, if it were, yeah, with multiple versions of that front-end component. Um, and now if I go down and say I want to say have some request percentage, um, I can see that this one gets about 90 and this about 97 is about 3% of the, the, the traffic. This will probably level out to like 90 and 10 because that's the values that I've specified. So I can say this new version of the application is just being canary tested. And um, if I want to know have more, I can change that ratio and eventually um, move it over to that new version. And I can easily use that visualization tool to say, is my traffic actually being routed correctly? And, and does the thing work as it is supposed to work? Um, yeah, so I, actually, you may wonder where this traffic is actually co is, is coming from. Um, I'm running a, I'm just running a kind of a while loop in some of the windows right here that basically just queries the web page very frequently. So this is not so, so super exciting. Um, yeah, technically speaking, to achieve that, we can go back in here. You need to have one of those sidecar proxies in each of your application containers. So um, you see that here and the list of containers, or if you basically go click in on that, um, and then you see this is the list of containers. We can do the, check the logs on the, on the various ones. This is actually the application. And this one is the one that collects all the network information. And in the end, this is all going to be summarized and then sent to the components um, in the uh, Istio names base where things are being aggregated and visualized. All right, so that's that. Um, and then I want to talk about one other thing, which is fairly new and, and, and pretty interesting, this one is called um, eBPF. And eBPF, if you have wondered, stands for Extended Berkeley Packet Filter. So if you hear that for the first time, I'd, I'm not sure if you're going to um, associate any kind of observability topic with that. Um, it's probably not the, the primary use case, but it's, it can be used for that really, really well. So I can't explain you all the way eBPF works, but I can try to summarize it, it really briefly. Technically, um, it's somebody explained it to me like, um, in a way, you can run sandbox code in the Linux kernel in a similar way as you can run like JavaScript in, in a web page. So it's kind of sandbox. It's not able to, to break out and do damage, but it still can run there. So 
the way this works, it, it can then grab kernel events from, from, the, from the Linux kernel and um, work on that, send it to a component in the user space, and then basically kind of evaluate it and, and process it there. So the important thing for us is all the kernel events that we can, that can capture here, um, of course, also contain networking events. So with using that technology, you are on a very low level of the operating system and can collect all the network data and then basically use it for taking actions in a later step. Now, why is that so important for us in the context of Kubernetes? Now, Kubernetes, as I said before, in itself is also running on various nodes. And these nodes normally run a Linux operating system and a container daemon, um, and, and then all the containers on top. But of course, it's also possible to apply this eBPF functionality right on that level. So having said that, um, you can run um, like the eBPF kind of edge components on the various nodes, similarly as you would run the, um, the the proxies in a in a um, in a service mesh environment. This time it's just like on the level of the nodes, where on the other side it's on the level of the pods. So footprint wise, you will most likely have a lot less node than you have pods. Um, so from a, from a, from that standpoint, you it will only be installed on each of the nodes once, and then it can act in a similar way that this acts as data, the data plane and then can send things to a control plane. Um, two technologies that have been around here is are called, one is called Pixie and the other one is called Cilium. I wanna go quickly into using the, the Cilium one just to see, um, just to so, show you how that works. Um, one second. So this one is still working as expected. What I need to do here real quick, I need to change my cluster context. So um, the if you're interested, the one we just saw with the service meshes is, is running on, um, on an Azure cluster. The one I'm going to switch to now is running on, on Google Cloud. And um, yeah, one reason is backup. One reason is not all the technologies integrate super well with each other. Um, so that's why I'm having uh, um, different things here. Now, with that EDTF component, I mean, um, it's also, it's not very intrusive in a similar way as service mesh is also not so intrusive. It can be injected and taken out just at runtime. With the EDTF component, it kind of makes more sense to kind of set this up into, into the cluster once you set up the cluster and then you can just leave it there um, and it, it won't, uh, won't change anything afterwards. Um, so I'm going to start this with this command. Okay, so this is potentially still running. Yeah, this one is still there. Um, and as you can see, it also, it only discovers those components which actually um, have some some network traffic inside. So if I switch to another workspace, like for example, the cube system workspace, we can see all the connection between the components in that workspace. So we have the, the cube DNS, which pretty much every component connects to. We can also see this one goes into to the other namespace where we have that, that uh, backend component running. I will just try to bring some, some traffic onto this one as well. I wonder why. So once I start with this and switch back to that other namespace, we should f soon see, okay, now it, it picks it up. So there's now traffic from out the outer world coming into our cluster. Uh, we can see which port it, it, it traverses from the UI to the back end. Um, both of them talk to the cube DNS um, because they need to look up um, the other components in in the application. Um, and down here is everything in like in like tabular format. 
So technically, uh, eBPF is, of course, also possible to measure the, the timestamps. These are not displayed in here um, in that UI. Maybe this will come later. It's a fairly young product. But anyway, I mean, with this visualization, it's, of course, a lot easier to tell, explain to people what is ha happening in a Kubernetes cluster as opposed to like very long kubectl outputs or even worse, digging through some, some, some YAML or JSON files. All right. Um, I'm not actually sure when, when my talk exactly started. Um, so um, maybe in the private chat, let me know if, if I have a bit more time. Now, <clears throat> I still have five minutes. OK, that, that's good. So looking back, now we've seen the Kubernetes API. We have seen um, uh, service meshes. We have seen um, uh, eBPF-based uh, kind of introspection of the cluster. And logging and tracing, um, of course, will then be very application-specific. Like all the things that we have seen so far don't really care much about if you write your code in WebAssembly or, or like using WebAssembly or using Java or, or whatever, because they only operate on the on, on the level of the of the network. Now, with tracing, things would be very much application specific. So I decided not really to demo much about that because we're not here to like figure out if there is a problem in that application or in, in where it would be. Now. I can just basically, this is like from our from our Kubernetes class. If you look into this, there's like a, a, a section about traces, um, what that will change. Um, so in here, in the end, you would be able to go down to like a class and method level. And this is something which will need instrumentation of your code. And this will significantly also change the footprint of, of the monitoring. Now, this is the cool thing with service meshes and, and eBPF, that it doesn't really change that because it listens to the traffic on another level. Of course, it cannot go fully into the application, but if you have like something being based on microservices, um, it will definitely already help you to isolate slow running components or, or figure out why are, is the traffic flow not exactly how I wanted it. Maybe the problem is not even in, in the level of that depth, Maybe it's in another level of configuration. So however, if you want to uh, find out what would be a good solution for you uh, when and, and how are the other tools playing together, there's an open source project called OpenAPM.io where pretty much all of the vendors and providers of open source toolings around, um, uh, around monitoring um, put their, their components in. And what you can do with this is just basically start building. Um, so we have categorization in storage, in visualization. And um, so I, I could say, for example, yeah, I want to use Kibana. And then Kibana shows up on that landscape. And then I can figure out what would be something that could feed into Kibana. So that could be like Elasticsearch. And what could feed into Elasticsearch? Um, quite a lot. Um, and so this is kind of a compatibility matrix of all those toolings. So as you can see, this would be very um, tough for me to all show that. So I much rather recommend you to use that side. If you see anything which is wrong, um, please just like submit a problem or try to do a pull request. As I said, it's all open source. If you think there is something missing, um, technology-wise, which is not um, listed here yet. Of course, you can edit too. But those things also make some nice architecture diagrams for um, for slides if you want to show that to your to your management or so. All right. So I think that was quite a bit of a rush through all those various things that I have been using in the past so far um, to get a better grip, so to say, about the happenings in my Kubernetes clusters. And if, if it's like, if you're dealing in a similar situation like me, 
working on different cluster environments, potentially in different projects and so on. Some of those tools can be really helpful um, because sometimes very obvious things are not, are not really visible straight away. And um, I hope I was able to show you a few new things here and you didn't know all that already. Um, I mean, as I said, it's like all, all of the things are, are open source, so I'm not getting any money whatsoever for rec recommending those. My recommendation is just really try them out um, and like give, uh, give feedback to the community in order to make those things better. And um, yeah, with that, I would like to say thank you and um, open the line for more questions. I, 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 was, I saw there's something went on in the chat for that discussion around Bosch. Um, which is, of course, a very great technology as well. 